You don't have to spend hundreds of euros or dollars to build a Hackintosh capable of most day-to-day -day tasks. In this video, I'm going to be showing you a Hackintosh running the latest macOS Ventura that can handle all of the tasks that the average user needs on a day-to-day -day basis and costs just 16 euros. That's around 17 US dollars or 14 UK pounds. This Hackintosh is running the latest macOS Ventura 13.5 and costs less than a family size pizza. It's based around the Fujitsu P420 E85 Plus. This is a desktop PC that originally came out back in 2013 and was targeted at the office market. These PCs are so common that there's always hundreds of them on eBay as offices offload their old PCs so you can often pick them up for next to nothing. I've seen them go for as low as 10 euros for just the PC, or 23 euros and 50, including a monitor, keyboard and mouse. I picked this one up on eBay Germany for 21 euros. It came with an Intel Core i3 4150 CPU, 8GB of DDR3 RAM, a 1TB hard drive, and a Radeon HD 7350 GPU but I made a few changes to this spec before installing macOS. First to go was the Radeon 7350. This is arguably one of the worst GPUs AMD have ever produced and it's not supported by macOS anyway, so it was basically useless. Next I took out the Core i3. This is only a dual core CPU and it's just not going to be up to the task in 2023. I replaced it with Core i5-4570 running at 3.2GHz. This is a much more capable CPU with twice as many cores as the i3 and it cost me just 13 euros. Finally the old rotational hard drive had to go. It turned out to be a Western Digital Caviar Green 1TB drive. It's not a bad drive as far as 10 year old mechanical drives go but for running macOS in 2023, an SSD is essential. So I replaced it with a 240GB Kingston A400. This drive cost me just 10 euros brand new and although there are better performing SATA drives out there, there are none that come close in terms of value for money. After buying the new CPU and SSD and then selling the hard drive for 14 euros, the Core i3 for 10 euros and the Radeon 7350 for 4 euros, it left the total cost of this computer at 16 euros, which is around 17 US dollars or just under 14 UK pounds. With the new processor and SSD installed, it was time to prepare the USB stick that would be used to install macOS Ventura. The installation was very straightforward. The first step is to download the macOS Ventura installer image from Apple and then create the bootable USB using the create install media command. After that I used OpenCore Auxiliary Tools or OCAT to prepare my EFI folder. The EFI folder is where the OpenCore bootloader along with all of the files and drivers needed to boot macOS are stored. OCAT comes with a link to predefined config files for various hardware setups. Since I'm using a 4th gen CPU, I chose the file for Haswell iMac 15,1. After opening the config file in OCAT, I chose Generate EFI folder on the desktop to create the folder. Then I needed to change the SM BIOS definition from iMac 15,1 to 18,1, since Ventura only runs on Macs from 2017 or newer. Then I added the drivers for Ethernet and USB and copied the EFI folder over to my USB drive. If you want more details on the installation, I'll be creating a full step-by-step -step guide in another video, which I'll link to down below. I also copied OCAT and OpenCore Legacy Patcher to the USB before finishing, since I needed to apply a patch for the integrated HD4600 graphics to get full acceleration in macOS. Now I was ready to insert the USB stick and install macOS Ventura. First though I needed to make a couple of changes in the BIOS. Under SATA configuration, SATA mode should be set to AHCI. Next, under graphics configuration, make sure that the primary display is set to auto, internal graphics should be set to enabled, 
IGD should be 64 megabytes and DVM-T memory should be set to max. Finally, under the security tab, secure boot should be set to disabled. When the computer reboots, hit F2 to bring up the boot selection menu and choose USB in the list. This brings you to the open core boot picker. Now select install macOS Ventura and hit enter. And the install process is just as it would be on a real Mac. The computer reboots a couple of times during the installation process, but OpenCore automatically selects the right partition to continue the install. After a few minutes, I was presented with the country selection screen and went through the account creation setups to create my macOS user account. Once into macOS, I ran OpenCore Patcher from the USB, which automatically recognized the Haswell GPU and installed the necessary patches to get it working in macOS. A quick reboot later and I was into a fully working macOS Ventura with graphics acceleration and hardware video coding enabled. The last thing to do was to mount the FE partitions for both the internal SSD and the USB flash drive and copy the FE folder from the flash drive onto the SSD. Now let's take a look at what this Hackintosh is capable of. To begin with, let's look at some synthetic benchmarks and see how they compare to some Intel Macs released in the last five years. In Geekbench 6, this Hackintosh managed 1,143 single-core and 3,461 multi-core. To put this into perspective, it's about 15% faster than the early 2020 Intel MacBook Air with a Core i7. It's about the same as an early 2019 21.5-inch iMac with a Core i3, and it's only slightly slower than the 2018 Mac Mini with a Core i3, a computer that still sells on eBay today for between 200 and 300 euros. That's about 15 times more than the cost of this Hackintosh. The weak point of this machine is definitely the integrated GPU. The HD4600 only scores about 3100 on the OpenCL test, and the Metal test won't even run. This is almost exactly the same score as the HD615 graphics in my 2016 12-inch MacBook. So how does it perform in actual use? Considering how much this computer cost, I was shocked at just how well it performed. For everyday tasks like web browsing in Safari or Chrome, editing documents in pages, email using Apple Mail, or watching YouTube videos, it's basically indistinguishable from any real Mac. 4K YouTube videos play back smoothly and without any skipping, with CPU usage hovering around 30%. Editing 1080p video in Final Cut Pro was smooth and responsive too. In fact, this video that you're watching now was edited entirely on this Hackintosh. I wasn't too surprised by this since I've edited hundreds of videos in Final Cut Pro over the years on dual-core MacBooks that were much slower than this Hackintosh. Editing 4K video proved a bit more challenging. Skimming through the timeline is fairly jerky and there were some dropped frames during playback until the machine had finished rendering, but it's definitely possible. One way to speed it up is by creating proxy media for editing but this takes up a lot of storage space and the SSD is only 256 gigabytes. Editing photos in Lightroom was probably what surprised me the most. Lightroom, along with most other Adobe apps, is notorious for being poorly optimized. So I wasn't expecting this to run very well at all. But I actually had no problems using this Hackintosh to edit 26 megapixel RAW photos from my Fujifilm X-T30. So, that's my 16 euros Hackintosh. It's not the fastest or the most powerful, but it's definitely the best bang for the buck that you can get. If you're just looking for a cost-effective way to try out macOS, or if you just need something to do basic everyday tasks like web browsing, media consumption, emails and word processing, then you won't find better value than this. It's let down slightly by the underpowered graphics, but we have a PCI Express slot which is just begging for a cheap graphics card. Which brings us onto another massive benefit of this machine. It's expandable and upgradable. You can increase the RAM, add extra drives, install a graphics card and a Wi-Fi card, 
and you can upgrade the CPU to a faster Core i5 or Core i7. In the next video then, I'll be showing you how I upgraded this Hackintosh for better performance in 4K video editing, with an NVMe SSD and a dedicated graphics card, and installed macOS Sonoma, while still keeping the total cost at under 60 euros. I hope you enjoyed this video, if you have any questions, put them down in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them. That's it for now, thanks for watching.